to go. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Andrew Parker. I'm a neurosurgeon here. Um, my journey in was uh, 50 yards down the corridor. I appreciate that some of you have come an awful lot further and it's been a lot more difficult. So I do thank you for showing your support for the uh, rather special organisation that I'm... Can you hear me all right? No, it's a bit soft. A bit soft. How's that working? Is that better? Okay, I apologise. I was just saying thank you to all of you who may have come a long way under quite difficult circumstances to support us. Uh, uh, this is a very special organisation I'm very proud to be associated with. Um, on your journey with brain tumors, often uh, one of the first people you encounter after you've had the diagnosis first mentioned would be a neurosurgeon. And that encounter might not often be uh, pleasant. Uh, it can be a kind of bruising experience. You might not have thought much about neurosurgery at any time in your life up until that moment. Um, and I thought I might just try today to fill in some of the gaps in knowledge and maybe give you a little bit of a perspective about what my wing of the profession's all about. So that's the question, what is neurosurgery? Uh, I've got this sort of fond notion of some, uh, yeah, that's uh, not me, that's my friend Martin Hunt, who's now in Melbourne, uh, focusing very intently on something very beautiful and delicate at the uh, bottom of a microscope with lots of kind of complex equipment, very small hole. Um, hmm. I'm not sure what you imagine when you think about neurosurgery, but that's a, 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 a kind of what pops into my head. I thought I'd just put that top of the, the running order today. Um, of course, I don't have a definition of what neurosurgery is. I went and Googled it, and this is what I came up with. Uh, uh, they were saying it's the, the medical specialty concerned with the prevention, diagnosis, rehabilitation, surgical treatment of disorders of brain, spinal cord, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, now, like all things on Wikipedia, it's only partially correct. Uh, I, uh, uh, I have very little to do with prevention. I've got quite a lot to do with surgery and a little bit to say about diagnosis. But uh, uh, rehabilitation is really someone else's uh, specialty, not my skill set. Let's get this in perspective. Yeah? I think my part of the profession represents about a half of 1% of the totality of medicine. If you've ever wondered why we don't attract an awful lot in terms of research funding, well, there's your answer, yeah? This is actually uh, uh, a really small thing, but it's massive and it concerns you. Uh, mm, another thing to say is that this is not new, yeah? Uh, uh, I think neurosurgeons can stake a claim to being possibly the world's second oldest profession. Uh, I think the politicians probably got there ahead of us, but uh, this lies in the Smithsonian, yeah? Um, uh, from the Andes, uh, being dated to about 8,000 BC. And he survived. He survived for years. Um, this is probably treatment of battle injuries. And someone's released a blood clot from inside the head, probably using nothing more sophisticated than a bit of flint. And he must have survived, because you can see how the bone on the edges here I can get my pointer to work, it's starting to kind of grow back. And that didn't happen overnight. That took a couple of years. No antibiotics, no antisepsis, the most rudimentary of conditions. Human beings are astonishingly resilient creatures. This is an excerpt from the, the Edwin Smith Papyrus. This is the world's oldest surgical textbook, three and a half thousand years ago. It starts at the top and it sort of works its way down. It gets to about here and all those other scrolls are lost of all the giblet surgeons, all their stuff never really gets a mention, but there's quite a lot of dentistry in there, ophthalmology um, and, uh, and neurosurgery. Again, a lot of it is focused on looking after people who've been injured in battle. It said, feel the wound, put your finger in. If you can feel a crack in the skull, I'm sorry put them to one side, they're going to get meningitis and they're not going to survive. If they haven't got a crack in the skull, bind the wound in muslin and honey, isn't that interesting, and put them to one side, nurse them, and they will recover. It's the first instance of triage, deciding who's going to do well and who's not. Now, this will be a bit confronting. The Americans think they invented neurosurgery. Oh, no. <laughs> this guy probably 
uh, Zachariah al-Razi in Iran in 900 AD, probably lays claim to being the first named neurosurgeon. He's probably the father of medicine as we know it. He was a proper scientist. He started to categorize things. He drew up the differences between measles and smallpox. He talked a lot about pediatrics yeah, and about neurosurgery. Yeah. Um, and he started a medical school and he started looking at scientific terms, trying to classify and understand and do experiments. Um, and uh, the sort of knowledge that he accumulated, particularly with regard to the anatomy of your brain, uh, became very important eventually, although it took a long, long time to come to fruition. And these days we can have uh, some understanding of where function is housed in the brain. Uh, we know that at the back there, that's the occipital lobe where you interpret vision. So all the nerve signals from your eyeballs at the front have got to get all the way over there to get turned into pictures. Some of us think that's a major design flaw. Um, uh, what else do we know? We know that up the front, that's where you have concentration and judgment and reasoning. Uh, speech and understanding is often sort of housed in around that area there, your frontal and temporal lobes. Movement gets initiated from this little wiggly bit here called the motor strip. Yeah, And then you can map out within that where you know, the bulk of your function lies. There's a lot of space given over to your face and your lips and your thumb, a whole lot less to your feet. So with the sort of understanding of anatomy, people like this guy, this is Victor Horsley. He's probably the first proper neurosurgeon. Yeah? Um, wasn't the first guy to do operations uh, in the UK on brains like this guy probably did, William McEwen, did a lot of brain abscesses, infections being a, a big issue back then. Uh, but uh, he could do neurology as well as surgery. In the past, you had to get a neurologist to localise using clinical examination whereabouts in your brain the problem was. I'm not sure if you know many neurologists, but they're not always that great at doing that. Um, um, uh, people like Jackson, he described epilepsy for the first time and was able to kind of correlate where in your brain your seizures were coming from and use that to kind of target operations. And uh, and uh, Godley, first person ever to resect a glioma, 140 years ago. Yeah, That patient made it for 28 days. Meningitis is what got to them in the end. Infections have always been the biggest barrier. But uh, Horsley, <laughs> it's such a tragedy. He died in a tent in Egypt in 1917 from typhus as a World War I battle surgeon. You know? And he was already way ahead of the game in terms of what he was experimenting with. And heaven knows how fast the uh, profession would have progressed if that hadn't happened. But yeah, here's some of his tools that he had. And uh, 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 back at Crude Square in the sort of turn of the century, the sort of early millennium, uh, there was a big outbreak of BSE in Britain, and you probably heard about all that when they fed a lot of cows back into the food chain. Uh, and they had to stop us using all our modern tools in case they got contaminated. They had to blow the dust off of these things and dig out some old trephines to make a little disc in people's skull. So these are actually really useful, although they should be in a museum. I can't... Uh, kind of uh, uh, ignore the Americans completely. Another great towering figure in neurosurgery is this guy, Harvey Cushing, so impressive that they put him on stamps in the States. Uh, uh, he was, again, another great pioneer of technique. Uh, um, he's often uh, 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 remembered best for uh, uh, things like pituitary surgery. Anybody here who's living with pituitary tumour? No? It's one of my specialty interests, but... Uh, um, once upon a time, you could only get to this part of your brain by making big trapdoors and then groping blindly down into the little area where the pituitary gland sits. Um, and of course, um, he uh, pioneered exploiting some of Mother Nature's corridors by putting instruments up your nose where there's far less in the way of important clockwork to get in the way. And he's doing that in the 1920s. Yeah. The big revolution in general surgery these days is uh, notes procedures. Uh, uh, natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. They don't want to put cuts. We all know that people put telescopes in. That's old fashioned now. Now they want to put flexible instruments into your stomach and perforate through the wall of your stomach, which will seal up when you take it out. And they can look around inside and do stuff 
with no visible stars. That's the next thing that's coming. But he was doing it a hundred years ahead of his time. None of us get anywhere <laughs> without uh, the efforts of this guy. This is uh, Alexander Fleming. And uh, uh, like much of uh, uh, original research, uh, it wasn't really a eureka moment. We don't get eureka moments anymore. I think his observation was more along the lines of, that's a bit weird and frustrating, uh, when he couldn't get his bacteria to grow. And then he worked out that it was a mold producing penicillin that was stopping them. Yeah. And that has been sort of transformative in the sort of post-World War II era for allowing neurosurgery to actually develop and be uh, effective. But you can't just uh, have him on your sort of list of important people, like list of developing antisepsis and Pasteur with his sort of theory of microbiology. And you know, all due respect, people like Florence Nightingale, who insisted on proper standards of hygiene, yeah? Lessons that we still need to heed today. Uh, this is Sandy Yarvis, my anaesthetist. I've been on call with Sandy every night, every Wednesday night for 15 years. Uh, and um, you can just see him sort of peeking out from amongst the sort of forest of, uh, of cabling and tubes and what have you. Um, I can't do anything without my anaesthetic colleagues and the revolution in practice that they've gone through in the last 40 years to make what I do on a daily basis achievable and safe. And then there's the imaging. Once upon a time, you could do an X-ray of someone's head and you can't really see very much on that. Sometimes you had a calcified pineal gland in the middle, like a little bit of chalk, which would shift from one side to the other to let you know where some pressure was building up. Um, then they started experimenting with injecting air through a lumbar puncture into your nervous system that would fill the ventricles, the fluid spaces in your brain. It's a phenomenally unpleasant thing to have done. Uh, but at least you've got some sense of what was going on. Or you can inject a contrast agent into your blood vessels and produce maps of the arteries, which is what that angiogram over there is. And distortion of the vessels gave you a clue as to where a problem may be lurking. But the big change came with this guy. Again, uh, <laughs> he's not a neurosurgeon. Hansfield uh, 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 was a telecoms engineer. Um, he was trying to actually build security systems for secure buildings and airports and things. Uh, and wanted a way to scan bodies. Um, then he got interested in hearts. Heart attacks in the 50s and 60s were a massive problem. Uh, but the computer technology at the time didn't allow him to image a moving structure. The sort of circuits were just too slow. So he thought, ah, we'll image the brain instead. That stays still. It doesn't move. And here you have it. This is the first CT scanner. It's in the Science Museum in London. And that's the first CT scan of a brain and the first demonstration of a glioma. Yeah. Now, the imaging back then, they're pretty rough and ready, but it was just the start. Uh, CT scans have possibly become the best tool in medicine. And I did an audit on this when I was a much younger man. And uh, patients turning up in emergency with a headache, about a one in three chance of a CAT scan actually showing a significant problem. It's possibly the best test. Well, no, it was the second best. Best test in medicine was a pregnancy test. Uh, uh, and it had about a 50% probability of success if someone took it. Uh, but here, this is some uh, poor kid who was kneeding ahead in a rugby game. A very large blood clot, uh, which is very obvious. You can get an instant diagnosis. You now know what to do. Imaging changed everything. And now you can combine CAT scans and angiograms and look at... Uh, details like all the wrinkles and crevices on the base of the skull, superimpose that onto a map of the blood vessels, which you never want to damage. You can see little things like aneurysms, little blisters on the surface of an artery. So the quality of what you can see now is astonishing. It doesn't stop there. And I've got MRI scans, which, uh, and this is a patient with a large glioma, it makes it very obvious where it's sitting with various tricks on the MRI scan. You can look at important pathways of nerves running through the brain and ap appreciate the impact that a growth might be having and stay away from these territories if you're trying to effect a removal so as to minimize the risk. These days, and uh, eventually I'll be put out of business because the radiologists, I could see my friend Slavka at the back there, uh, 
we'll be able to characterize tumors on the basis of their chemical composition using techniques like MR spectroscopy. And if your MR looks a bit blank, then there are other techniques like PET scanning that can highlight areas within to, again, to tell you where to focus your efforts. There's also been a huge revolution in technique. And the guy possibly responsible for pioneering much of this is Gennady Yazagil. He uh, started in Switzerland, but as soon as the Americans realized how good he was, uh, he ended up over there. Uh, he, uh, uh, his breakthrough tool was an operating microscope. Again, around the 1960s, he began to use that and he could see with much greater clarity what you were doing. You could be much more precise and a whole armamentarium of tools was developed to enable people to do microsurgery. Again, another huge revolution. This is a little retractor. Eureka moments. Uh, his daughter Layla was playing at home with a little uh, game with the balls and blocks with a thread running through them. And you turn the little knob and the thing would tighten up and fix. And then you untighten it, it would go floppy again. And the light came on, go, that's just what I need to hold the brain back so I can get in there. And so this Layla arm is still a sort of ubiquitous piece of kit in our operating instrument trays. So neurosurgery now uh, evolved into a, a very complex uh, uh, specialty with lots and lots of subspecialties, you know, trauma and intensive care, vascular, uh, hydrocephalus, fetal neurosurgery, even operating on people before they're born. Uh, radio surgery, spinal stuff, and of course, oncology, which is what concerns everybody in this room. But that's just a tiny part of, of what was already a tiny sliver of the totality of medical practice. I think the only thing that's constant is the fact that it all keeps changing. Nothing stays the same. Most of the operations I started out doing are no longer relevant. I think the half-life of a procedure is about seven years because um, there's always something new being thought up. Um, yeah, there's constant striving to improve what you do. A lot of it gets driven by technology, although mm, how much the technology changes the outcomes is uh, a matter of debate. Uh, uh, individuals and their enthusiasm or the circumstances that people are forced in are often as big a determinant as what happens. Uh, although the uh, emphasis is always on trying to do things safer, more swiftly, and make them more effective. So uh, 500 years ago, the kind of instruments we, we had were pretty gruesome. This is all for dealing with depressed fractures in the battlefield in, uh, in medieval Europe. Uh, look, we've come a long way since then, although at the start of my career, we were still using sort of old-fashioned uh, brace and bit to get through the very obvious barrier of your skull. Uh, these days, we have uh, much more uh, elegant uh, high-speed drills. That was a gas-powered one. It's now been superseded uh, by uh, electric ones, and there's beautiful ultrasonic scalpels that can be used to kind of open up the bone just to get me in there to do what I need to do. Um, that was the first glioma that I ever operated on when I was all 26, yeah, I'm now, so how far have we come? Uh, that's one from a couple of years ago, you know, the, the diseases stay the same, but the uh, way that we approach them has changed quite radically. When I first started out, I was told that the uh, uh, management of uh, patients with uh, malignant gliomas, for example, was simply managing the expectations of the family. I was outraged. Uh, uh, but you know, 30 years ago, that was really the prevailing view. The fact that I'm here today, I'm hoping is an illustration of how uh, um, uh, much I reacted to that statement and uh, tried to uh, change that. And it has changed quite radically. Um, once upon a time, what you'd get if you had a high-grade glioma would be some of this, and dexamethasone is a drug that's been around forever, and when I started, they're promising there'd be something new just around the corner, but as yet, there isn't, unless uh, more news for me. Um, uh, uh, you might get a, a biopsy of your tumour 
using a, a beautiful, oops, sorry, I go back, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, mechanical uh, device that's now, uh, although it's a wonderful piece of engineering, is almost obsolete these days. And you go and get uh, uh, radiotherapy. Uh, and the big game changer for me was just as I was leaving the training program, when they uh, finally showed that drugs like temozolomide could be transformative for uh, patients with high-grade gliomas. I'm sorry to keep focusing on high-grade gliomas, but I suspect a lot of what we'll be seeing um, during this conference will focus on that, as well as other genes. Um, hmm. The uh, arrival of that seemed to change the prospects. And at the same time, there was a sort of paradigm shift in the surgical treatment. Uh, that coincided with another revolution, this time the development of an image guidance system, SatNav for your brain, if you like, so that you could, on the basis of a brain scan, produce three-dimensional models so you knew where you were at any one time and you could focus on the problem and try and stay out of the important stuff around it. And this made surgery easier, theoretically safer, although we also became a lot more ambitious. And there's always a sort of trade-off uh, when you're trying to aggressively treat tumours in the brain. You don't want to go too far and cause harm. There's all sorts of other technologies. Uh, the MR revolution enables us to see where critical functions are housed within the brain. We can stay away from them or plan around them. Uh, we've got devices like little miniature hoovers to sort of suck out tumours from delicate you know, uh, little recesses. Um, uh, we can put uh, uh, MR scanners in an operating room and see how we're going halfway through and whether you need to do a bit more work. They've only taken a bit of a chunk out of that tumour there and they needed to go back and carry on, although mm, there's still evidence of stuff deep in the cavity there. So they help you a bit, but they often won't help you do a complete removal of something because to do that you're going to end up in some very delicate area and end up causing some harm they've tried other things those are little uh wafers impregnated with a chemotherapeutic drug that you can drop in the hole you've just taken a tumor out of and we went through a vogue of using those although they didn't really give you sufficient bang for your buck. And I encountered lots of complications with wounds falling apart and people having a terrible time with, you guessed it, infections. Um, so that in this country, it never really got traction, although it's still used these. About 10 years back, we got very excited because they developed drugs that would be absorbed by tumors and make them fluoresce under an ultraviolet light down your operating microscope. Well, it all went great, yeah? We'll be able to see exactly where it is, be able to remove it all. And that's what uh, a brain tumour down a scope looks like. It's very hard to tell what's tumour and what's brain, to be honest. But if you put some glylan in there, it does fluoresce. And if you're one of those surgeons who goes into the middle of a tumour and hollows it out from the inside, then that's great. He can tell you when you're getting close to the edge. Personally, I've got a different view. Um, we all grew up uh, in different parts of the world with different uh, techniques. Uh, and just at the time I left the training program, they released the big trial that said that you know, doing more aggressive resections and giving people temozolomide was a good idea. And they got better outcomes. But up until then, no one had ever taught you how to remove them. And I ended up at a small island in the Pacific. And just like you know, tortoises in the Galapagos, you know, you evolve uh, to suit the kind of circumstances that you're in. And so a few years later, I went back to see my friends and said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd go around the outside and try and lift them out on block. And they looked at me like I'm from Mars. But uh, uh, I'd done a lot of bowel surgery, for example, prior to coming here. So we used to take out bowel tumors just on block and lift them out. Uh, so, uh, again... If you live in geographically isolated locations, you'll come up with a slightly different solution. Uh, I must say I've almost given up using Glyland these days because I think I, it didn't seem to make a big difference to the amount of you know, tumour I could remove from people. Although it's still got its uses and some of my colleagues are still enthusiasts. Uh, but the whole point was, do you know how anybody read this? Yeah. Henry Marsh's book, Henry was one of my great mentors when I was 
And if you ever want an insight into what I think, he comes quite close uh, a lot of the time. I'll commend it to you. But that principle uh, drove another revolution in brain mapping, trying to understand where in people's brains function lay so you could stay away and cause less harm. Um, neurosurgeons are just fashion victims with more degrees, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, uh, this was you know, had a big surge in popularity, and rightly so, but may have been sort of overused, and it's quite an expensive resource if you have people in the room testing your speech function. And if you try to apply it in every single case, then we just don't have the resources to do that. So it has a place, uh, but I don't think it's a sort of solution to all of the problems. Yeah, as I was often reminded uh, in training, you know, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, I think the uh, this is the human genome represented as pairs of socks. So uh, um, I think surgery is not the answer. Yeah, it's only part of the solution for gliomas in particular, but other tumors too. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Eric and uh, NC, when they come and talk, might talk a lot more about uh, uh, how new classifications of tumors might lead to newer, better tailored treatments that will be more effective than anything I can do on my own. So yeah, uh, another truism. The future's already here. Uh, this is meant to be an update on glioma. So far, I've just given you a historical perspective. I wish I could tell you there was some wonderful new technique that I could use that's going to change the world. No, surgery is surgery, and it's not really changing. Uh, and predictions, this is a Niels Bohr quote, is always difficult, he said, particularly if it concerns the future. But uh, am I going to be getting one of those anytime soon, these Pictures appear in our journals and they try to goad us into buying multi-million dollar operating rooms with integrated MRI scans and huge video screens and ceiling mounted uh, uh, microscopes. And no, I'm not getting one of them anytime soon, if ever. Um, maybe focusing on smaller interventions might be more cost effective. This is something I'm developing uh, using... Uh, uh, catheters placed into tumours down which you can deliver energy from a laser beam to basically cook the inside of a small tumour and ablate it. Uh, the visual aid system is just one such, uh, uh, but you need to be sort of super accurate in placing uh, something like that. Um, and you can see your tumour kind of just uh, cook slowly inside an MRI scanner. Uh, at the moment, it's only uh, kind of fit for very small lumps, about two or three centimetres across at most there's a sort of plastic dome of a skull with a little glow from the laser beam in there and a little operating robot. I've now done about five cases with one of these just to kind of get the workflow right and get my positioning right. And then once I can uh, be certain, I'm going to try to use this machine to try and ablate deep tumours where otherwise it would be almost impossible or too hazardous to go. So the future, yeah will be less invasive, that's true of the whole of the surgical spectrum. Uh, there's gonna be a, need a lot more collaboration and probably some subspecialization. At the moment, I'm a general neurosurgeon. I do about 80 brain tumors a year, yeah? But I've got a, another 120 other things to do. So I can only really focus on this for part of the time. I think there's gonna be a lot more automation and robotics that's coming um, and AI decision-making, because at the moment you're relying on my experience to know what to do and I'm accordingly fallible with dreadful confirmation biases yeah um, and a machine will probably do a better job we need to focus on the outcomes and make them better I don't think Health New Zealand has the faintest idea what the outcomes for his patients I've been batting on about this for 20 years they invest lots of effort in gathering information on costs yeah but not what happens you know the cost but not the value better education. Well, everyone's here today. Reflective practice and constraint, you know, we're going to be limited in what we can do because the government simply won't fund it. That's what makes this environment different to others. One thing we're really good at in this country and get properly is teams though. And I'm very privileged to be part of it. It's a fantastic, uh, uh, the girls on the ward don't know this, but they're, they're, they're like, they're all blacks of neurosurgical nursing. 
you know, in a small town in a small island in the middle of the Pacific, and they can punch way above their weight. Um, I'm very lucky. The quality of the people I work with on a daily basis far exceeds some of the big teaching hospitals in London that I trained in. Yeah, I don't think they realise quite how good they are. I think we still have a bit of time to care in this country. Uh, it's not so pressured that we've lost track of that. And you get the sense that everyone's got everyone's back. Now, <clears throat> one of my fellows, this is Khalil Abdullah, who's professor of neurosurgery in uh, Pittsburgh now. But once upon a time, he was over here doing a bit of an OE. He sent me that snap from a skyscraper in New York. Yeah, uh, and it says, uh, beat three brain tumours, and at 57, I gave birth again. Uh, not necessarily everybody's idea of uh, yeah, life plan, perhaps, uh, but you've got to admire the ambition. And they said, uh, this is one of the big neurosurgery institutions in New York, you know, every day is a day to rise, they said. So uh, I, uh, I remember that when I'm on my bike, heading into work every morning. That's the current view. Uh, at this time of year, you get a fantastic sunrise, uh, uh, when you're heading down to Newtown. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think there's a new dawn on the horizon. I left enough time for questions and answers, Chris. Okay. <laughs>